These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, these reassuring words of our Lord Jesus Christ give us reasons to be confident of his continued presence among us, among those who believe in him. Not without reason, he told us, let not your hearts be troubled. Definitely, we have many reasons to worry, to panic, and to be troubled, but he constantly reassures us not to let our hearts be troubled. He did promise to be with us till the end of time, and his presence among us till the end of time is in various ways, but especially through the action of the Holy Spirit in our lives as individual Christians and as a believing community. You will definitely be familiar with the explanation of the relationship between the various books of the New Testament. I guess you have an idea that the same author is believed to be responsible for the gospel according to St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. And I believe you also know that the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, drew from one another from similar sources, and they are very familiar in many aspects. Whereas the Gospel of John is unique in its own presentation of the life and teaching of Jesus. And the other books of the Gospel, we don't have many references to the gift or coming of the Holy Spirit. But in the Gospel according to John, we have various teachings of our Lord that draw attention to the fact that when the, Sp that the Spirit would come and that when it came, there would be some power that would be added to the apostles, but with an emphasis, an underlining, that whatever the Spirit was going to teach the apostles was not going to be anything new, because the source is the same. All we know is God's self-revelation through his word, which became flesh in Jesus. So his, the life and teaching of Jesus is all that God has said, even in the Old Testament, and all that he continues to say through the action of the Holy Spirit. Of course, we know that God's revelation to human beings came through the word at creation. God's word first became things at creation. Then his word became words in the prophets. And his word became flesh in Jesus. And finally, his word became presence in the spirit. The same word. And this word, one truth, does not contradict himself. And that is why Paul wonders that through the word of God in creation, some people are unable at least to decipher some truth about God's self-revelation to, to his people. 
Now, the book, the gospel according to Luke, ends in chapter 24, towards the end, after Jesus' resurrection, before he ascended into heaven, he told the apostles something interesting. He told them to remain in Jerusalem. Remain in this city until you have received power from above. The apostle is not supposed to go about narrating his experience of the living Lord without the help of the power of the Spirit. And that author continues then in the Acts of the Apostles to tell us that they were still gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem when the Spirit came, empowered them, and they dis started sharing their experiences. The Gospel of John, on the other hand, at various points, promises the apostles, Jesus promises the apostles of the coming of the Holy Spirit. But the difference is that immediately after the resurrection, Jesus appears to the apostles and says, Now, receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, so do I send you. Let us not be lost in the details or confused by them. The central message is that the life of the church, that is, the group of people that believe in the message and life of Jesus Christ, that life, of the life of that group is sustained by the presence and action of the Holy Spirit. The first reading gives us an example of the action of the Spirit. When we imagine the church we are sitting in now and the beauty of the Eucharistic celebration, we forget the difficult journey from the time, the day of Pentecost till today. By the way, the day of Pentecost was the day the church was inaugurated in the presence of the 12 apostles and our blessed mother. Please, Catholics, the only church that has had an unbroken history from that day till today is the Catholic Church. Quote me anywhere, the true Pentecostal church in the world is the Catholic Church. Every other church may be a protest against the Pentecost, but that is for another day. At Pentecost, when the apostles received the Spirit, they started preaching to everybody without exception. And many people believed, and Jesus told them, in, according to Luke and also uh, Acts of the Apostles, beginning from Jerusalem, but before long, people who were not from Jerusalem also heard this message, especially after the death of Stephen and the persecution of the apostles. The disciples scattered, except the apostles who remained in Jerusalem, others scattered and started preaching the gospel even as far as Samaria. And above all, as Paul joined the group through a spectacular experience of the Lord, he moved even farther away. But this had its problems. The first problem was when Peter was invited and led by the Holy Spirit to the house of Cornelius, as we are here in Acts chapter 10. He was confused. Because at the beginning, the, Gen the Jews thought that Jesus' message was just for the Jews, the chosen people of God, and a completion, a, con a, a fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham, and therefore that only the children and descendants of Abraham had a right or a title to this salvation. 
So Paul, Peter did not know what to do with the revelation he received and the invitation he received to the house of Cornelius, who was not a Jew. But he felt propelled by the Spirit. Visited Cornelius, preached to his household. The entire household received the message and they were baptized and the Spirit descended on them. In chapter 11 of Acts of the Apostles, there is already a problem. People criticized Peter. How dare you, our leader, our pope, our archbishop, now break the rules so early? How dare you go to the house of pagans and mix with these uncircumcised? Peter says, see me, see trouble. Are they my own? No. This kind of wahala come. Say, waiting God, don't bless me and no feet call unclean. What did I go do? And that one, no do self. As I know, I never say open mouth, talk, spirit, come land. If you land on them as you land on us, what did I go do? They say, ah, okay. if not so, you're correct too. And they thought that was the end of the problem. Now look at the way we were sitting. Those, if you look at me, you think I'm a young bishop. I am not a young bishop. I'm an old man. Because I'm old enough to know that there was a time in the church women sat on one side and men sat on one side. When you hear that now, you smile. I'm in, old enough to know there was a time no woman dared ascend the sanctuary. I am old enough to know there was a time those sitting in the pews were not supposed to understand what the priest was doing on the altar. I am old enough to know that there was a time no woman would come into the church with his, her head uncovered. Now you are smiling. These things came through constant attention to the promptings of the Spirit. And no single bishop, let alone priest or chairman of the parish council, has the powers to make these radical decisions alone. Each time the problems came up, then the church would return to the source. And the presence of the Lord in a spirit of humility and prayer, and together, you hear them say, the apostles and the elders. The apostles were the overseers, the episcopoi, the bishops, and the elders were the priests, the presbyters, the presbyteroi. And they united with the people in prayer, and after long discussion and prayer, they will take one step forward. Listen attentively to the order of the creed we pray. I believe in God, the Almighty Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, who redeemed us. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who descended from the Father and the Son, and immediately after that, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. That order is not coincidental, and it's not accidental, because the church is the place of constant action of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't believe that the Holy Spirit is constantly acting in his church, then you have no business praying or confessing the creed. And this is what I think is the source of many of our problems. Very often in the midst of misunderstanding, we forget that primarily we have to refer to God's direction in prayer and open ourselves to indications from the Spirit. Because Jesus knew. 
challenges would arrive that were not foreseen at the time he was on earth. But he knew also that with the help of the Holy Spirit, his followers would find the solution. Today, priests and bishops are not married in the Roman church. It took hundred years, hundreds, nearly a thousand years of prayer, debate, reflection before that decision was taken. Just in case tomorrow now, after prayer, debate, and consultation of the Holy Spirit, the church decides to open the door again for married priests. You say you are leaving the Catholic Church. Prepare now, because you never can tell where the Spirit is leading, leading this church. Don't forget, you are laughing. Some people left the Catholic Church because Mass is now said in English instead of Latin. And they forgot that Jesus did not speak Latin. The stage at which we are in the church now is not the final stage. The church is in a journey, it's a pilgrim church, but we must be open to the Spirit. And in the debate between the acceptance, uh, 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 on the acceptance and non-acceptance of the non-Jews, uncircumcised persons in the community, it was a fierce one. There were three camps at least. On the one side, you had the extreme right. Now we have divided the society and political organizations and even the church into right and left. The right, at the right, you had the conservatives led by James the Elder. Those who believed that this was the way the Lord did it and what he taught us and nothing was going to change. And besides, anyway, we are children of Abraham and only children of Abraham are entitled to this message. On the other e extreme, on the left, you had Paul. Strange. And I will tell you why it is strange. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was an extremist as a Jew, intolerant Pharisee, prepared to kill, to defend the purity of Judaism. But once he was touched by the Lord, his openness, so to speak, became extreme, and he felt nobody should be excluded. There had to be a mediator, a middle ground, this middle ground was covered by Peter, the leader of the group. Leadership is not an easy thing. Even in the family, you have to open yourself to the two extremes and steer a middle course. Now I was talking about being old enough to know how things worked before. Many of the people sitting in this church now don't know the gramophone. All they know now is MP3. Some are not even familiar again with CD, not to talk of cassette and LP and so on, going backwards. But in the age of the gramophone, you had the large record, the LP, long play record, that you placed on the, on the disc. At the center, there was a pin. And for the gramophone to play correctly, for the records to rotate correctly, that pin must be firm. If it wasn't firm, the record wouldn't play well. But if you watch the gramophone, as the pin moved, as the record moved from the center to the externals, it moved faster. As it moved towards the center, it will move slower just in case you are not understanding the liveliness of priests like Father George and then the seriousness of priests like Monsignor Pascal, some people have to be at the center and remain firm. I don't know whether that is the case, but sometimes you have to understand that the dean and the assistant parish priest cannot be equally disposed to inventions. At any rate, 
just like in the human being, without that firm center, no human being can live without a backbone. Because without the backbone, you can't stand up erect. But the backbone has also to learn to bend. A backbone that does not bend is no use because you keep knocking your head against obstacles. That is the experience of life. As Peter and Barnabas experiencing the action of the Spirit in the field, encountered some people who came from Jerusalem where James was leader and, and bishop. They came and told those in Antioch, look, you guys, except you get circumcised, you will not be saved. And Paul said, from where did this come? In that debate, it occurred to them they had to return to counsel. They had to return to prayer. And there was a long debate. Read that passage attentively because what we got was a summary. As they presented their cases, Paul and Barnabas did not argue at all. They just presented their experience of the Spirit. God does not need arguments. But I want to tell, remind all of us that it is easy to be a liberal, extreme liberal, in the presence of other liberals. But if you think of the sensibility of those who find it difficult to accept change, but they also want to be saved because they are also members of the family. So long as it is not about the essentials of the faith, you must be prepared for compromises. And that was what happened. They said, okay, you don't need to get circumcised, but don't behave as if there were no Jews among you. So abstain from certain things that we Jews find offensive, and you are okay. Glory to Jesus. In our society today, we are in difficulty because we have lost the capacity to listen to others, the capacity to dialogue, the capacity to present our case and allow the other person present their case. But above all, we have lost the capacity to listen to the word that will dwell in us and lead us gradually to the full understanding of the truth. Those of you here who are married, all the ideas you had about marriage on your day of wedding, is that what you found in the actual married life and family? Problems you never imagined would emerge. And you know what happens today? At the first experience of problem, the family is broken. And as if that was not enough, those broken families, broken homes, betrayed trusts are splashed on the pages of social media as models and as, as examples for young people. Because couples fail to realize that as domestic church, as small church, they have to remain open constantly to the promptings and directives of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will teach you everything and remind you of all that Jesus wants you to do in every given circumstance. Let us pray, therefore, as we approach the feasts of Pentecost for an, a greater openness on the part of all of us to the teaching that comes from the Holy Spirit. But let us also remember that the Holy Spirit, the truth of the Spirit, the Spirit cannot teach us anything different from what Jesus taught us. The conflict sometimes we find within the Catholic Church between the so-called 
charismatic church and a hierarchical church is a false conflict created by selfishness. Because if we check the gifts, charismata, charismatic, the gifts of the Spirit to the church, you find some listed in chapter 12 of, first, of first, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and you find others listed in chapter 4 of his letter to the Ephesians. But we all need to know that the hierarchy, the order, the firm center is also a gift and is a primary gift of the Holy Spirit for the church. But in spite of that, if you remember the story of Paul in Galatians chapter 2, when he encountered Peter, who was prevaricating between his openness to the Jews and criticism of the, uh, to the Gentiles and criticism of the Jews, Paul told him, you as leader can't do this, which means our gifts complement one another. And nobody has these gifts for himself alone or for himself alone, but for the growth, growth of the community of the believers in Christ. We pray for the church. We pray for our families. We pray for all the gifted persons in the church that, like the early church, we learn to present our problems before the Lord, listen to one another, listen to the Holy Spirit in order to resolve our problems. And in that way, be shining examples to the outer world, to the Nigerian society, about how differences could be solved. Peace be with you. As I thank Monsignor Pascal Mwezapo for the opportunity to celebrate with and for you this Sunday, through him also I thank the Archbishop of Lagos, Most Reverend Alfred Adewale Martins, who has permitted me also to be here in this capacity. And I thank all of you for your prayers, for your perseverance as Catholics, as Christians, as citizens in Nigeria in a very difficult moment. If you don't remember anything I say as bishop, you have to remember that Bishop Ona insists Christians should stop complaining. We should change this country. It is possible and we are capable with the help of God. But we don't want to change. We want others to change. All of us are conservatives when it comes to insisting on doing things the way we have been doing it. If not, while going home now, if you have a car and a chauffeur, a driver, insist on sitting in front. And they'll say, oh, God, what do you, need you can't do here now? No, be so. Why? Because you must sit behind. Where is it written? Tomorrow, if you are a corporate, a banker, or a lawyer, while going to the office, dress differently from the so-called corporate dressing. And everybody will protest. Why? Because this is how we do it. That is how we keep perpetrating evil and say it is how we do it. And Igbo people say, na jife bara for menane. When evil is repeated, it becomes custom. And by the way, the very people who want the church to change every week are the very Catholics who don't want anything to change in their custom in their village. So, we have all to open ourselves to the Spirit and know that it is possible to do things differently to be a better church, a better family, and a better country. That is my prayer, and that is my wish for all of you. The Lord be with you. May the name of the Lord be blessed. Our help is in the name of the Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth.
The mass is ended. Thank you.